I, I imagine that for many of us, this is a very, very, very familiar passage. And uh, what I find amazing is that somehow God can speak to us over and over and over and over again from similar passages. That's the amazing miracle of the Word of God. Amen? So I want to pause and just um, ask that the Lord would in fact do that. Lord God, we thank you for this familiar and amazing passage. We pray, Lord God, for ears to continue hearing what you've been saying to us all along today and this past week or weeks. We pray, Lord God, that we would come away encouraged and provoked, Lord God, to be about your business. We ask this in Yeshua's name. Amen. <coughs> and this week, um, my darling grandson, who is not here, and that's why I can mention his name, otherwise he would be mortally offended, um, was watching a movie, one of these apocalyptic type movies. Uh, I don't know, every time I go to see a movie and I see the, the, uh, the ads, so many of the movies are, are about the end of the world, you know? Uh, that's been the theme that Hollywood seems to be cranking out more and more the last 15 years. You kind of wonder why. I actually don't wonder why. Um, this particular movie um, had the uh, theme of the robots taking over the world. When you had these big monstrosities coming and zapping people and uh, and so I needed to take this boy home and we had a discussion and um, I pray for, from time to time that God would do something with this mouth of mine and give me words to speak to this fellow. Uh, he comes from a pretty rough background. He's not a believer. Um, and so, of course, he pointed to the notion that it was theoretically possible that at some point, uh, because of artificial intelligence, that the uh, the computers would rise up and decide to take over and do away with us. Um, and uh, I, of course, agreed with him that it was theoretically possible. <laughs> but I, I just, uh, I felt the need to point out a basic a reality about my ethnic identity as a Jew um, is based on the fact that God has preserved us for thousands of years even though all kinds of nations around us have gone the way of the buffalo or whatever form of animal life was there uh, that somehow God has seen fit and been able to maintain the nation of Israel. And I said to him simply that, yes, while it is theoretically possible uh, that the computers will take over and endeavor to annihilate humanity, for me, the reality that keeps me relatively sane is the notion that God is in control and that he transcends all things and he somehow is able to manage reality. And the odd thing is, even though this fellow is, is not a believer, he made the statement that he feels like God has protected him. Um, as I mentioned, he comes from a very rough background, mother in prison, dad around um, and I said to I simply said to him you know the fact that a you're not bitter B uh, your mind is not messed up 
is indicative of the fact that, yes, God has been protecting you. And uh, I often recognize the fact that we as believers live in, in a difficult age. Um, I'm not wanting to park on the, the fact that evil is increasing, but it is. Um, and so for us, th there is the struggle of what are things going to look like in the future? Um, some of us don't want to think about it because we've got plenty for the, you know, to deal with just for the moment. But every so often, I think, uh, we end up thinking about these things. And these believers in Thessalonica, which, by the way, is north of Greece in, in Macedonia, um, struggled with these things. And, and people struggle with these kinds of issues when they're going through hard times because they, they want answers. Uh, and these Thessalonian believers really, really had a tough time. Um, Paul, when he came and with Silas and began the ministry here, uh, was what we call baptism by fire. In other words, he came, he uh, proclaimed Yeshua in the synagogue, and some people accepted, and uh, Jews, um, God-fearing Gentiles, and others. Uh, but real, real quick on the heels of that, the opposition, which was primarily Jewish, went to work. They chased Paul out of there. And then when he went to, to a different town, as you know, called Berea, they went to get at him, and it continued. Uh, Paul refers, as you read First Thessalonians, uh, the first three chapters, you'll see, that these believers continue to experience a great deal of trials, great deal of suffering. Um, and even though they were relatively new in the faith, they had persevered, they had continued, they didn't buckle under and uh, become mishugi and, and, and deny the Lord and so on and so forth, um, which could have been what, what, what might have taken place. And in fact, Paul is so delighted with these guys that he says that who you are and how you've been living uh, has been spreading all around, not just to the rest of Macedonia, but to Greece as well. In other words, the fact that you've been able to hang in there through all the suffering has been quite a statement to other people and encouraged them. And I want to pause here for a minute to reflect on the fact that sometimes when we go through difficult times and somehow, somehow, God manages to sustain us, um, it is not only a blessing for us that we're able to persevere and continue and grow through the difficult experiences, but our example actually ends up uh, being an encouragement to other people who go through dif dif difficult things. Remember that when God is at work, He is at work on multiple levels. And being a Trekkie, I have to come back to this example of Spock playing chess with a computer and... Uh, who's Spock? <laughs> Leonard Nimoy. Um, is playing chess on multiple levels, and uh, I can't conceive what that would look like. I, I have a hard time just playing chess on, on a flat two-dimensional board. And the reality is I think that's the way most of us operate. We, we deal with reality as it is on the flat, flat plane. And God, on the other hand, works on multiple levels. Works with us, he works through us, and so, that apparently is what was happening in, in Thessalonia with these believers. But as you can imagine, 
um, there's always opposition of a different kind, and particularly for folks who are not well grounded in their knowledge and understanding of the Word of God and who God is, people come along and, and whisper sweet nothings in their ear and get them confused and bamboozled. And that apparently what had been the case with these Thessalonian believers, which is why we have two letters that in one form or another address the issue of the future and end times. What is, the, what is that going to look like? Um, and uh, last Shabbat in, in chapter 2 uh, of Second Thessalonians, we saw that these guys were concerned that the Lord came already and, and they were left behind. Not to use the uh, analogy of, of the Left Behind series. Um, and so Paul had to spend a bunch of time in chapter 2 of, of the second letter um, laying out um, before them some basic reality that before the Lord would come and establish his kingdom that there would need to be uh, the uprising led by this guy that he called the man of lawlessness that we often refer to as the anti-messiah or the antichrist. But here in this chapter... Um, in 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, Paul addresses a different issue. And that is, what is going to happen to my loved ones? Now, if you're as old as I am, then you get that. Because people come and people pass on, and you wonder about them. Um... And that's something that occupies your thinking, particularly as you begin to deal with your mortality. The simple fact that you probably will not live, will not live to be a thousand years old. Um, and so in this section, Paul is talking to these folks about their fear. Uh, what would happen to their loved ones? Will they ever see them again? Will they be part of the big picture of Yeshua coming? Uh, or will they be out there in limbo, nothingness? And unfortunately, some folks have bought into that, the notion that after you die, uh, you kind of exist in, 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 in a uh, la-la land, in a nothing, uh, in, in an existence that really has no significance. Um, as we'll see in a moment, Paul and the rest of Scripture make, his, make it very clear that you and I have an individual identity here and in the future when we go to be with the Lord, when we pass on. So Abraham is Abraham, Paul is Paul, Floyd is Floyd, Chaim is Chaim, etc., etc. So Paul here um, chides these guys that they had allowed themselves to get sidetracked and, and upset. Um, he says to them, we don't want you to be ignorant. And whenever someone makes that statement, it's a clear implication that, yes, you have been ignorant. Um, not so much in a derogatory, what's the matter with you stupid idiots, but rather saying to them, look, we spent a bunch of time teaching you about the future, teaching you about what we know the future will look like, the end times, primarily because of what Yeshua taught us and what we have received from the Spirit of God. We're passing on to you so that you're aware of the fact that there's more to this life than what we are experiencing. Eternal life begins now and continues beyond into the, into the afterlife. So he's chiding them gently for allowing themselves to get confused. Um, and he basically says, look, I, let's get the facts straight um, about those who fall asleep. 
Now, you might look at this word, fall asleep, and you think, okay, that's a euphemism. Why don't you just say die? Well, I believe there's a reason. And the reason simply is, just like you fall asleep, you wake up. You pass on, you die, and you wake up. That's the hope and expectation that we have. Why does Paul tell them not to grieve? By the way, he doesn't say, do not grieve, period. He said, don't grieve like those who have no hope. Now, let me just park on this for a moment. I've been to two kinds of funerals. I've been to the Jewish funerals, to the Christian funerals. The Jewish funerals have liturgy, prayers, that speak about the resurrection. However, in a typical Jewish funeral that I've been to, there's been no mention of the resurrection and minimal amount of mention of God. And the advice, the counsel had been, um, you need to mourn, which is half the picture. Yes, you do need to mourn. That's normal, it's natural, it's human. It's what Yeshua did when Lazarus died, he wept. And the Christian funerals that I've been to sometimes have this uh, other world kind of reality where we're celebrating the life well lived. Well, that's great, but I'm sorry, I hurt because I'm missing someone and it's, I'm grieving. And so that seems to me another ditch because Paul doesn't say do not grieve, period. He says don't grieve how? Like those who have no hope. We, we grieve, but we have hope and expectation that we'll see our loved one at some point in the future. And Paul continues then to remind these Thessalonian believers of what they had already heard from him and from Yeshua. We believe that Yeshua died and rose again, so we believe that God will bring with him, with Yeshua, those who have fallen asleep in him. In other words, simple reality, if Yeshua died and rose again, you bet your sweet bippy that you will rise from the dead as well. That's the assurance. And remember that these early apostles spent all kinds of time talking about the resurrection. It was their favorite theme. Yeshua died and rose again. Yeshua died and rose again. Yeshua died and rose again. On and on and on. Because that was the substance of the message. Not just that Yeshua died for our sins, but that the power of God was displayed in the fact that Yeshua arose from the dead. Which means that you and I are empowered to live life for God. Verse 15, he says, according to the Lord's own word, which of course is taking us back to Matthew chapter 24 and 25. If you were here a couple of weeks ago, Rabbi David spoke about that. Um, we will certainly not pre precede those who have fallen asleep. In other words, the fear and the concern for these guys was, um, what's going to happen to our loved ones? Are they chopped liver? Does God care or not care about them? Are, uh, and Paul makes it very clear here that our loved ones, when the Lord returns, will have precedence over us. God doesn't forget those who have passed on any more than he forgets us when we're going through whatever we're going through. And part of the picture as well, he takes them back to Yeshua's instruction that there will be a massive gathering of all believers. And he quotes, he refers to Yeshua's teaching again, where, where the Lord says, the Son of Man will appear in the sky 
will send his angels with a loud shofar call and will gather his elect. Remember that the blowing the shofar was um, a summons to gather. And so the fact that the shofar will be blown on that day means that God is saying, all right, y'all, time to uh, come up. We have some business to do. Again, God has special plans for those who have passed. In verse 17, after that, we who are still alive and left will be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. The word for caught there, harpazo in Greek, has the sense of being grabbed by force suddenly. Um, and if you go into Latin, that's where we get the word rapture or uh, grabbed um, suddenly. And so we will be with the Lord forever. Now, a simple statement, folks. But I don't know about you. I've heard so many uh, funky explanations of what that means. And, you know, sometimes the Word of God gives us a statement. And we can either take it at face value or else try to make it more complicated. Right? Right? So we will be with the Lord. That means we will be with the Lord. Okay? You can try to make that a whole lot more sophisticated, theologically, etc., but we will be with the Lord. Um, by the way, why will there be a loud shofar blast? Well, remember... Paul was a Jew, and he's writing from his Jewish background. What, what comes to his mind when he thinks of a loud shofar being blown? Mount Sinai. When the Torah was given, uh, the mountain was on fire, and it was quaking, and there was a loud blast of the shofar. In other words, it's kind of like a uh, um, light and sound show where God is saying, okay, everybody, get ready. And that's part of the expectation. Now, where, of course, where we write encyclopedias and give tons and tons of teaching is about the timing. And you know how it is. Inquiring minds want to know. Well, God isn't interested in what inqu inquiring minds want to know. What did Yeshua say about the timing issue? No man knows the time. Not even the angels. Not even nobody. And of course, we look at that and we say, well, I'm just not a nobody. I'm somebody. So people have been trying to break their teeth over this since the, at least the year 175 CE, where people had come up with 175 reasons why Messiah will come in the year 175. So as I mentioned last Shabbat, there are some things that are very clear. And what is very clear, folks, is that believers will go through hard times. I don't think I need to spell that out. Um, Paul says, all those who live godly will suffer persecution. Not one of these things that you want to put on your mirror and uh, be part of, of uh, you know, put it on your, on your palm, etc. That's reality. Why? Because if Yeshua was opposed, if we follow Yeshua, guess what will happen to us? If you haven't experienced some of that, uh, just you wait. In fact, what the Lord said in, in back to the Olivet Discourse in Matthew 24, there will be great distress, unequaled from the beginning of the world until now, 
never to be equaled again if those days had not been cut short. No one will survive, but for the sake of the elect, those days will be shortened. Very, very clear to me that during this period of suffering and, and God's wrath being poured out on rebellious humanity, there will be people who are believers on this earth. Now, you can argue that they become believers or were they believers all along and I'll leave that speculation to you. What comes to mind is God is able to protect his own like he did to the people of Israel in Egypt. There were ten plagues that came upon the Egyptians that did not touch the people of Israel. The short version is that believers need to know that through thick and thin God's presence is with us. And that his power to sustain us is there. And we in the United States are convinced that it is our constitutional right to be spared from any difficulties in life. Because we follow Yeshua. The answer, of course, to that is no. Um, what the Lord does promise is that he'll sustain us. His presence will sustain us. His presence always sustains us, folks. Amen. And so because of that, we're grounded. We're not all over the map. We're not confused. We're not bamboozled. Uh, we're not tweaked by every Meshuggah teaching comes down the pike. Why? Because we, we know and understand that the Lord is coming, that th things may and will be difficult, but that somehow God is able to keep us, as he always does. And because of that, we become encouraged and strengthened, but it can never just stay with us because what Paul here and the rest of Scripture the rest of scriptures say to us over and over again, encourage one another with these words. That's in chapter 418. In chapter 511, therefore encourage one another and build one another up just as you are in fact doing. Um, by the way, there's, there's nothing mentioned about duking it out over the precise um, timing of the Lord's coming. Encourage one another. The Greek word parakaleo means to comfort, um, to plead, to exhort, because sometimes we need all of that. Sometimes we go through difficult times, and I know sometimes folks come in here on Shabbat morning, you can look at their visage, their face, you know they've had a hard week. They need to be comforted. Then other times, for whatever reason that happens to all of us, we get discouraged to the point of maybe being indifferent or even hardening our hearts towards the Lord and, and saying, you know, I, God, I thank you. I know you're here, but I'm going to take care of business. And that word also includes being challenged and being exhorted. I like what the book of Hebrews in chapter 10 puts it as provoke one another to love and good works. Um, we don't do it as judges. You know, we don't point a bony finger and say, brother, sister, you're way out of line. But sometimes we look at someone and we say, you know, I really don't think that what you're doing, the course that you're taking is very productive. And we don't say it as judges because there's one who is the righteous judge. But we say it as fellow strugglers. 
Because we all struggle, folks. And we say it lovingly, out of concern. Um, and let God figure out how the person will respond. But encourage in, in, involves all of that. Comfort, plead with, exhort. And that, folks, comes from a basic commitment to love one another. Paul says in, in earlier in chapter 4, now about brotherly love. That, by the way, is Philadelphia, in case you wondered. <laughs> brotherly or sisterly love, obviously. We don't need to write to you because you've been taught by God to love one another. And in fact... The brothers and sisters, in fact, we know you're doing that. Yet, we urge you to do more and more. A couple of things about this. Love for me, or as I understand scripture, is about a commitment to see God's best in a brother or sister. And yes, there is emotion involved, obviously. There's affection involved. But the commitment is, is to say, you know, I really desire God's best for you. Because if you can't say that, then encouraging, exhorting, provoking, none of that really matters much. It all has to come from a heart of love. And furthermore, love is, has to be growing. That over a period of time, you look at someone and say, thank you, God. You're teaching me how to love this particular prickly individual and you're teaching me how to dance with porcupines. Of course you know nothing about that. <laughs> but all that to say, uh, yes things have been difficult, they'll continue to be difficult and the Word of God says to us, M-Y-O-B, mind your own business. Verse 11 here, make it your ambition to lead a quiet life, to mind your own business and to work with your hands, just as we told you, so that your daily life will win the respect of outsiders, so that you will not be dependent on anybody. Again, remember folks, these people were suffering. The temptation to do an escape trip, say, God, beam me up, was very real. But he says, no, you lead a quiet life in the midst of all of that. Because this is how God keeps you grounded in the knowledge that he's coming, that he's got things under control, that he's with you. Through thick and thin. And I'll finish with this Rabbi David mentioned earlier, and uh, Renee as well, about the, the new office. And uh, I, I was intrigued, amused. We have a couple of, of large filing cabinets. And of course there were things going back to the dim and distant past. Uh, if you're new to us, let me point out that we've been around for 30 years. This is our 30th year. And so I was looking a couple days ago at sermons from 2001, just before 9-11. And then I realized something, you know, life is radically different today than it was at 9-11. And uh, Joy and Isaiah and I are planning to take a trip to Texas next month to see our daughter and husband and granddaughter. And I used to enjoy flying. I've been flying about 50 years, folks. And I'm thinking about the fact that at some particular locations you come and without getting very explicit and crude, uh, you feel you've been abused when you're, you're done with this. Um, and I remember 
pre pre nine eleven, you come, you get your ticket, you show your passport or your driver's license and a story. And and you say, okay, this is life as we know it. I don't expect that we'll get into a time capsule and go back to pre nine eleven. Um, if you're an observer of the current scene, you know that we're kind of moving in that direction. And we can either say, God, beam me up. I'm done here. Or we can do what Yeshua tells us and what Paul tells us, what the Word of God tells us over and over and over and over again. You and I are ambassadors in this crazy, whacked out world. We've been positioned here strategically by God to make it. It's not just life about me or those that I care about. We've been positioned here to make an impact in, in this world. Because remember, folks, the Word of God tells us where sin abounds, grace abounds even more. In other words, where there's yuck, God's power is able and extended in a way that is greater than it was before. So yeah, we're moving that direction. And yes, we've been spending several weeks, and we're not done yet, looking at, at end time prophecy. But hopefully this will be and has been an encouragement to all of us to press towards the Lord through thick and thin, through regardless of what it is we're going through, because we know that that's what life is about. His call for us to be His representatives, His ambassadors here in this earth, particularly now. Let's pray. Avinu Malakainu, we thank you, Lord, that you indeed reign in all kinds of environments. We thank you, Lord, that you give us the confidence, the necessary confidence, not to build our reality, to build our skyscrapers on our ability or other people's ability, but Lord, to build our reality our foundation on who you are. I pray for each one of us, Lord, regardless of the circumstances we find ourselves in. Lord God, that your Ruach, your Spirit, would stir within us the passion for you, Lord, the zeal for you, the sense of urgency during this time. Lord God, to pursue your call on our life, to look at folks around us with compassion and recognize the fact that they need you, Lord. Empower us, Lord God, by your Spirit to accomplish the commission that you have given us in this day and age. We ask this, Lord, in the name of Yeshua, our Messiah. Amen. We'd like to take a few minutes to reflect on Anything and everything you've been hearing today, at your seat or come up and pray with some of us. But all that, let me just urge you to simply say, Lord, where am I in relation to what it is that you are doing? Invite the Lord to bring you into closer alignment with his plans and purposes.